Hello everybody! Hi and welcome to the third live in our series Conversations with Artists. Uh, my name is Laura Bivolaru and today I will be joined by visual artist and my Revolve colleague Alexander Morand, whom I am going to quickly invite now. Hi, Hi Alex. Hi, how are you doing? All right. Uh, just checking if the sound is all right. Yeah, you sound good. How does mine sound? Yeah, good. Nice. I got my uh, Oh, well done. Um, <laughs> I only have water. <laughs> Boring. Yeah. Uh, so I thought while people are still joining in, uh, maybe we could say a few words about ourselves, just because we're the latest addition to the collective. I mean, yeah. we too and Victoria. Uh, would you like to start? Yeah, sure. Um, so I'm Alex, anyone who hasn't known me already. Um, I'm an artist working across photography, uh, film and the kind of expanded field. Um, I do a bit of everything actually, what it feels like I do. Um, I joined Revolve Collective, I think just over a year ago now, right? Mm, yeah. I think, was it February last year? I think March. And I actually remember it because it was uh, very unfortunately just a couple of weeks before the lockdown. Oh, yeah. So, <laughs> so we all joined and then it was like, nope, nothing for you for like a year. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, oh yeah, so we joined just after the Scene 15 programme that uh, the Revolve guys had organised and yeah. we, all, we all participated in the talks, didn't we? And then, yeah. Uh, yeah, then I got invited and I think you did at the same time, like a week or so afterwards or something. Yeah, um, we've, uh, I mean, we've had the people in Revolve, we've always sort of known each other for a bit of time before we actually joined the collective so the the joining in the collective was something organic that just came from knowing uh, the other four members and kind of realizing that it would be nice to work with you mm. and that's a really good point because I um I knew Ibby quite well before and then uh, I knew Victoria through uni um and that was it and i met kraz through victoria's like um uh we did a reading group mm -hmm. do you remember that yeah um, the reading group and then yeah i just guess and i met lena and lucas after that i think at like you know some exhibition opening you're like oh so you're the other from revolve members so um yeah and it just came kind of happened naturally didn't it it was a good fit yeah, and uh, I met Krasimir, I think, maybe a year beforehand um, at a Tom Lovelace show, actually. Uh, and it's still uh, Victoria who introduced us. Uh, uh, so the Victoria, uh, yeah, 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 the flower, Flowers Gallery. Yeah, nice. Uh, we met there, we went to a pub and we talked for the rest of the night. It was... Uh, nice intellectual love at first sight <laughs> that's that's the best when like two like newly formed artists have like this new relationship and they go to the pub and they can speak all night that's when you know it's good yeah we connected instantly yeah um so actually we both um graduated from our bas a few years ago in 2017 right yeah yeah that's when um, i graduated mine you from falmouth yeah, found uni down in Cornwall, um, and then I had a year sort of working in London and then went back to uni at the RCA, um, where you had already started. Yes, I, I graduated in 2017 as well from Westminster, but then I went to RCA straight away. Yeah. So no gap year, although that could have been useful. Do you think? Yeah, 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 yeah sure. 
I guess there's there's advantages for just powering through, but yeah, it worked for you. <laughs> so just the people who are joining now, we are talking a bit about ourselves and when we joined Revolve just until more people join us. And then we will talk about Alex's film, A Virtual Like Self. Uh, and then I suppose you could say we're emerging artists, recent grads, because you graduated last year mm -hmm. and I graduated two years ago. So it's actually quite recent. Yeah, definitely. Um, feel, I feel very much like a, a new grad, even though that was almost 10 months ago now. <laughs> wow. Just, time has slipped through <laughs> my fingers and I feel like, oh, nothing. I've achieved nothing within that time, but it's cool. It's a slow burn. Yeah, maybe we should, um, you know, everybody just agree that um, 2020 doesn't count and we'll just erase it from yeah. history. <laughs> that would be a great move. That would be good. Um, Hi, Kras. Hi, Tom. Yeah, some familiar names joining us this evening. Okay, should we wait for a bit longer or just mind. get into it? Should and then people, on? yeah, people can always watch the re replay if uh, it sounds interesting. Yeah, nice, nice. Uh, good, so because we talked about us studying photography, and um, tonight we're going to talk about your short film. Maybe you could tell us um, how did you make the shift from still image to moving image? Like what prompted this? Um, I mean, it's not a change, but it's more, more like an expansion of your practice. Hmm. I know. Um... I guess it's good to like go back to the beginning for me. It's quite hard to like find out exactly when that shift would occur. Um, but uh, during my like dissertation on my MA, I was writing about, um, I, was ex I was exploring the process of writing and this idea of the formation of self uh, and characters within stories. Um, and like that was a very beneficial process for me because I started thinking a lot like wider about things. Um, I wasn't so, um, like it really opened things up and like through the process of writing, I started to think about how like when, when you write a sentence, you're literally building or forming an image and you're like, you're moving up to and reaching an image or maybe the words are reaching you, that kind of like push and pull. Um, and so when I finished the, the, the writing, the dissertation, I was like knackered, um, but I knew that that kind of new under, newfound understanding would want to like trickle through into like a visual output as well, rather than just um, a text. Um, so I started thinking about uh, working with film and maybe I started working with film because uh, as photography, it's a very easy way of reaching an image or making an image. You know, photography I'd argue is probably the best way of making an image on demand. And then I guess film follows closely second. Um, mm. But also like film has a different relationship with images. And I felt that I could use that medium to explore photography. So choosing a medium slightly outside of photography to look at images in a different way or to learn more about them. Mm -hmm. And so you started from your dissertation um, but your dissertation was, was it about images or was it mainly text-based? Um, and I'm, I'm only asking this because um, I don't think I discussed photography in my dissertation, even if, you know, I was on a photography course. Yeah, I think that was the benefit of like being like liberated in the writing. Um, I went for one of those very kind of like self-reflexive pieces of writing where it was just like, a rambling narrative um, but really I was looking at different devices and how like writing is handled uh, like a material 
Um, and I was revisiting old journal entries and exploring, um, I guess, the image of myself then to now. And I was marking the, the differences and um, through the progression of time, basically. Um, and there were sections where it was like theory on photography. Um, I think the best section was about um, the car as camera um, and this idea of a car relentlessly driving down a motorway and windows being apertures. Um, and so I used photography theory to link into old stories to try and further what I understood of images generally. Um, and I guess, yeah, I, I learned that it's not just photography, it's trying to understand the nature of image through, mm. through photographs. That's very nice. And um, your film is shot on Super 8. Mm. Um, how did you decide that you wanted to work with this specific kind of film? Mm. Um, well, I, uh, I'm really interested in like, anachronisms. So, you know, like, obviously, like using an older medium is immediately kind of an anachronism because when viewing the work I've made, you kind of question what, ti what time it's from purely by the medium uh, and the delivery of that. Um, and so that was like an important thing for me. I like trying to like uh, shift when the work was made, like kind of divorce itself from itself. Um, and then also it was kind of like a homage to, you know, I do a lot of uh, research into the 60s and 70s uh, like conceptual practice, performance, land art and things. And often like Super 8 and 16 mil are used uh, for documentation. Um, so like Nancy Holt's a great example of that. She was constantly like making film works, um, which bordered on this interesting uh, boundary where they are works in themselves, but they're also documentation. Um, and I really enjoyed that and constantly return to that idea where you're not quite sure of what you're seeing and its context um and so that's why i felt like naturally attracted to to super eight um and I, I you know i just i asked a friend if i could borrow theirs and so luckily i've been using it for almost two years now on long-term loan um and yeah, it just came from that really so would you say your film is um a documentation or a work in itself where does it sit oh i think it's a work um because i would if i was using the film to look at another artwork then it becomes like uh, an inception but because my film is just observing um things i haven't designated as artworks then i think it is the film is an artwork it is not looking at artworks mm. And actually, um, the film is shot in camera. So I'm actually curious how the planning for this came about. Um, did you, I mean, did you, were you already aware where you would shoot? Uh, did you scout for locations? Um, I'm really curious about the practical aspect of because in a in a normal film let's say um a writer would produce some sort of script mm. um so i wonder how you did it um well because the film is so expensive have you shot super 8 film before mm -mm. so right. this is this is ectochrome color positive film so it's designed for projection. So like the work would be projected in a gallery, um, ideally like through analog projector. Um, so, uh, cause I could only afford two rolls. I, and I think on each roll it's three and a half minutes. So I had what, like seven minutes around, give or take, um, to make the film. And that's all I brought with me. And I was away for a month. Um, I think the only thing I'd envisioned was sort of the opening frames the opening shots there's three opening frames of the sea from different angles um that was i'd imagine that like a week or so before leaving for the trip 
Um, and it's kind of interesting because normally I'm quite like a meticulous uh, person. Like everything I do has to have a re- has to have a reason for why I do it. Um, and you know, to be efficient with time and money and stuff as well, I really like consider what I'm doing and why. Um, I'm not like I don't just just randomly do things. Um, so for me, it was just considering the first couple shots, and then as I went, I I built the the narrative in my head. Um, you'll you'll see in like the film a lot of the scenes uh, have a base uh, length of ten seconds. Um, so I worked off of that kind of okay, ten seconds for that, change eight seconds for that, change ten seconds for that, and so I started like editing the film. Uh, and using like memory to recall what had gone and what was going to be coming. Um, so actually, it was a really intensive process because um, it's so precious and it's all shot on camera. There's no like editing or splicing afterwards. So it's all one stream of thought essentially, and I wanted that. Mm. I can imagine, and you know, being on location and trying to remember what was your last shot yeah you know was that difficult to kind of always have in mind what you already shot and maybe try to kind of plan for the next Mm. okay there was there was no planning like you didn't know what the next shot would be no so i would keep like notes I, i use my notes on my on my phone a lot um, mm-hmm. So I would note down roughly 10 seconds on that scene, then 20 seconds on that scene as I'd done it. But then really I had no idea of what would come next. And instinctually when I came across a scene or environment or something, you know, you get that kind of reaction. As a photographer, you get that reaction. So you're like, I'm going to make an image now. Uh, and then as, as someone <laughs> making a film, I had that reaction, um, which is just instinctual. Um, but I had you know, roughly considered like motifs or or ideas that would recur through the film that I was actively looking for. Um, I think one of them is the one that you you spoke about in your uh, little like text was uh, water. Mm -hmm. Um, So, you know, obviously the boat carries you in to what you call the island. And then throughout the film, you see water reoccurring, um, whether whether that's through like irrigation um, or through just the texture of water reappearing in things that aren't water, um, and then obviously waterfall and things like that. Um, so, like, I was aware of those, but really it was a much more open process of being receptive to what was occurring outside of me. Mm. And I also noticed how, um, you know, water always moves. And Mm -hmm. then there are some other elements, I think, that move, like the car, for example. Mm -hmm. Uh, You see the you see the road once being left behind. You see it in the mirror of the car. And uh, once you see it from the front seat of the car, kind of, you know, the car advancing. So you have these two movements. Uh, But towards the end of the film, you bring these more static shots uh, of this lush forest and cliffs and uh, a woman who is sitting and she's taking in the view. And I wonder if this is something that you planned. So a lot of movement with the water in the first part of the film and then more still images in a sense. Mm. No, um, yeah, definitely. I um, so I, as I said, I was being receptive to movement, and what what that didn't have to be traditional movement. Okay, the car is a traditional movement, uh, but the way light moves across a wire is maybe not traditional movement to observe. Um, and so I was actively searching for that because it was about this, you know, as I said at the beginning, this like falling or the appearance or the becoming of image, and lengthening out this process of basically me photographing but if a photograph was 10 seconds not a fraction and if it was an elastic band it was stretching that process out for you but for a different medium Mm. um and so when you say like the film does build to the static figure 
um, and that's my grandmother. And um, so I was up in the hills with her on, on holiday, actually. And um, she suffers from vertigo. And so it kind of became this thing where I was continuously looking for external movement. And then through her, it became an internal, obviously, falling. Um, and so I thought it'd be interesting to place her in the center um, as a still portrait. And then the only thing you can see as I move around her is her breathing. Um, mm -hmm. And I guess it's this like attempt to to get movement to permeate the skin uh, into a different vessel. So the movement goes from the exterior world to the interior world. Um, and that's like totally, completely in my brain. Like no one else would know that unless we just, we just said that. Um, so I guess it's like an in-joke for myself. Mm. So I guess that's where the title of the film comes from, mm. Vertigo Like Self. Yeah, um, it, it came from that and also uh, like vertiginousness being like a literary term for falling within words. Um, that's something I also spoke about. Um, so they kind of just pro um, came together like that to make the title. Um, and also that there's many cells within the film. Um, it's not just the, the maker and the medium. The medium is a self. And like, as you say, there's different people reoccur in the film or like appear in the film and um, so it's a meditation on many different selves other than myself <laughs> yeah so for the most uh of the film it's just the camera kind of recording what's in front of it but on two occasions other people appear mm. first there's a young man who is shown a drawing an architectural study and I think he's in a cloister mm. um, it looks like a religious setting mm. that was um, a... sorry what are you gonna say yeah uh, I was just saying that so the second person is your grandmother and I wonder if you imagined a relationship between these two let's call them characters mm. No, I, I definitely did. It was so that was shot from my friend. I was with my friend, and um, he was drawing and um, like some of the architecture. And it was in Van Gogh's Asylum, um, uh, where he stayed for a year. Um, obviously, it was a very traumatic time for him. Um, and we visited, and it was an amazing space. And my friend was—he's an architecture student. He was drawing the architecture, um, and I started documenting from different angles the formation of his image. Um, so he, you know, it starts with a blank page, and with the pencils just on the side, and then you see him doing like preparatory sketches with pencil, and then there's this like building of layers as he uses different colors, and I guess it's quite a visual nod to the idea of an image being formed or an image being reached, um, and so maybe whether as the grandmother is falling internally. Um, the guy drawing is falling externally uh, onto the page. Mm -hmm. Because his whole attention is, mm, you know, drawn by the image that is being created as you're filming him. Mm. It's, I guess it's, it's really interesting. I guess it's kind of like cylindrical as well because it's uh, light touches the building the image of the building travels through his eyes, goes through his like retinas and his receptors and it comes out through a muscle and then through like instinct as to what he believes colour is and shape to be. So again, I guess it's like, there's this like um, uh, discussion about images within the body and leaving the body. Mm. And then, um... So would you say the camera is the third self that appears in the movie? Yeah, there's definitely the maker, the characters within the film as selves, and then the, uh, the medium is a self. And I guess the medium is trying to look at itself. Um, another thing is that 
you chose to show the entirety of the surface of the film. So actually it's not just, you know, the subject matter, what the camera recorded, but you have over scanned the film and the film's movement is very much an essential part of what you show the viewer. Mm. And I wonder if that, um, you know, why did you make this decision to show the film surface? Mm. Um, so like the overscan. Um, yeah. Yeah, no, that was really, I, I'd noticed that that technique when I just started using film, like I'd, I'd process a test roll and I'd seen that that was an option in terms of like the, the guys that were scanning the film for me. And I chose it and I was immediately like, this is an integral part of the work. Um, I'd never, because I'd never shot film like that, I'd never been able to experience the before and uh, the present and then the coming. So it was like past, present and future contained within a frame. Um, mm. But then it's framing itself. Um, so you get this feeling and this like subtle movement as the, the film goes like that, you know, it like jiggers, it moves like it's on a train, like it's on a track and it's a carriage moving. Um, and you get the sense of like space in the image, but also uh, things overlapping. So you get um, uh, the waterfall, for example, flows across all of the images, the, the past, the present and the future. So you, you question like where does the image begin and where does the image end? Um, and actually that's something, you know, when you ask me about did I, how did I choose what to shoot? Um, I often try to choose things that I knew would uh, overlap the frames from the past mm -hmm. to the present to the future. Um, so you have this like stretching out. Um, and so I guess, yeah, the, the technique of overscanning helped support the the meaning and the context of the work and why I was even making it. And it was really nice to, I mean, you see the film moving, but I don't think it's really visible which way it's moving at first. Mm. Um, and for the first several viewings, I thought it's moving kind of upwards, if that makes sense. So like the, um, the past is at the bottom and the future is at the top. But actually, um, I think I did a screenshot at some point <laughs> and very luckily it was just when the subject was changing and I saw that the frame at the top was actually the previous frame and I realized that the film is actually falling, it's now going up. Um, I love that, that it's falling. And I love that your detective work, that you were like, <laughs> you, had to, you had to work out which way it was going because if it's going the other way, it completely ruins the whole context of the work. <laughs> yes, and of course it, you know, because of this vertigo idea that you're exploring, it's essential that the film falls and mm. doesn't actually move in an up ascending direction mm. definitely um, the um everything within the film is falling and moving uh whether it's towards or away from us that's up to you but then in a physical space hopefully when i if i ever get to show it um you'll be able to physically watch the film moving and falling around itself so would it be projected then? That's yeah. your ideal presentation of the film? Yeah, it'd be projected. And I'd also have to like sand away the, um, you know, projectors have a little like a gate or like aperture. I would have mm. to, that's because it, you know, it normally crops the, the past and the future to just have the present. And um, I would sand away that so you could see both because it would have to have the over the overlay. So you'll have to break the projector. Yeah, I'll have to break it. <laughs> yeah. Um, I was going to ask you one question actually, um, and that was how you've written a beautiful text for anyone that hasn't read it. It's on Revolve's website. 
um, and it makes the film sound so much better than it is. Um, <laughs> but no, it's interesting, like how you came to the film because it's very open, en open ended, and purposefully like enigmatic. Um, it's hard to sort of put your finger on as to why and how. Um, so I wonder if maybe you could talk about the process of drawing meaning out of something, um, such as the film and the text. Mm, I think I personally was instantly attracted to the film because it seemed to reflect um, what I had been thinking about uh, for the past years and my my research at the RCA was about time and as I said my dissertation was actually not about photography it was about um, time and history uh, and obviously when I saw your film I was like <laughs> you know this is a good representation of some aspects of time that I have been thinking about. Um, and it looks first, right, like a sort of holiday film. You know, it has like that Mediterranean feeling to it. Mm. The sand, the sea, um, I don't know, the kind of, you know, the town that you're showing for a few seconds at some point, and then the traveling. Um, but if you watch it a few times, you realize that it goes deeper and deeper into uh, kind of what you were saying, uh, movement from moving to being still. Um, and I was really fascinated by this. Uh, and then, yeah, it is open-ended, like you say, um, but in a sense, meaning is always um, kind of created within the viewer, um, and even with more abstract work, I think that's just what the brain does in the end. Uh, it just makes up some sort of narrative out of everything that is laid in front of your eyes mm. and um, for example because you spoke about the boat when you have the boat as a symbol it already entails traveling traveling means being transported to a different place this new place is you know fertile ground to explore new ideas new concepts so you know, just from an object, from a symbol, you can draw out so much meaning. Um, but because you mentioned the text that I wrote about the film, I think that came from a very specific viewpoint, which was to, you know, do this exercise of a surface reading of the work. And uh, we didn't talk beforehand, which I thought it was probably for the best. Mm, definitely. And I think I was trying to not inhabit, you know, the artist's shoes, not constantly think about what did the artist try to say here? Why is he showing me uh, water? Why is he showing me a woman? Um, and I think I was just trying to inhabit this autonomous position of simply being the viewer and kind of allowing my mind to put two and two together and to see kind of where that takes me. And I think the funny thing and fascinating in the end was that we did have a chat afterwards and we found that so many ideas were overlapping between what your original intention was and what I had come up with, which I thought it was great. And yeah. I'm actually wondering, you know, does that mean that the work is successful? Is that what a successful work is? Mm. 
thank you that was really beautiful what you said uh i love that it kind of it seems like you're saying it, it builds meaning upon like with further viewing or with further reading and also mm. like how important it is to read work uh w without the artist as the context for how to read the work um obviously you should do both at certain times but um it's like shows like it's a really beneficial exercise mm -hmm. and also it seems like you had a lot of like of your own uh you could say baggage your own like film uh interests and i guess it was like a, you were a perfect person to kind of read and like introduce yourself to the work if that makes sense mm. um and what did you say just just before you finished i was wondering because we found that many ideas were kind of overlapping mm. oh, uh, yeah. in between what you had planned what ideas you had planned to kind of uh, you know plant in the work and what i had read in it i wonder if this is what makes a successful work definitely i i would agree with that as an idea of what successful is something which i guess uh is loaded with suggestions and then it can function on its own and it needs to go off on its own and do its own thing and mm -hmm. but yeah for me like that's if you're the one person that's reacted to it that's a great success for me because it's <laughs> for me like hearing what your thoughts when you've uncovered the things i've hopefully tried to plant within it and you you touched upon them and also expanded upon them and that's like that's very successful for me mm -hmm. So I wonder if uh, people who are following us have any questions about Alex's film. I think there was a question at some point. I saw something. I just have to scroll a lot. Did you find any questions? I found one from Kraz um which said can you describe the different scenes and spaces and actions of the film for whoever hasn't watched it? Um I think we've probably touched upon that quite a lot. Um but there's farming, cityscapes, uh portraits, nature, forests, hills, cliffs and the sea. Awesome. So yeah, it's quite circular in a way because you start uh, by arriving to this place by sea, and mm. then there's what is it? At first, it's like some um, crops, and then some shots of a, a town, mm. but then you travel deeper and deeper into the nature which i thought it was quite interesting as well and it's also kind of like an ascending movement because the car travels on these waving mountain roads and then mm. you end up in the mountains at the end it looks quite high where where you are uh, so again you know different types of movement that you can um find out in the film Oh, yeah, the the building of altitude, as well. Mm -hmm. So weirdly, the film is climbing, and then it falls at the end. It would have been better if I started at a high point and then worked my way down. <laughs> um, I actually thought it was really nice to kind of start by arriving by sea and then leaving by sea again because it has this uh, element of circularity in a sense so it's like it's not like a linear narrative where the character or let's say the camera in this case travels through this space and encounters some i don't know action or subject matter and then you know the story kind of ends it moves and then it goes back to where it started um mm. 
and it makes you wonder what was the purpose of the journey you know mm. if you end up you know in the same place was there a purpose at all mm. i i love that the that the cyclical nature um they arrive and depart in and and you're not quite sure whether you've departed when you arrive or whether you've arrived when you've departed <laughs> yeah. um and i guess up to whether it means anything at all is again the reader isn't it um i've just seen that prasa said one thing um alex since words and theory of focal point of practice how do you negotiate the creation of a film that lacks any voice text or narrative um i think laura has done like amazingly to speak about how narrative is formed um and i think it was a really good practice to or a good exercise to try and make something which hasn't like forced its narrative um i think often like people can overly direct the work or they can overly restrict it um maybe i've been um guilty of that in the past um so i guess for me it was just like letting go uh, which sounds quite cliche but it's actually quite hard to do if you're a perfectionist um and i just know that the the sensation can carry the film for me on its own and then my sort of wider reading um helps support it in conversations like this i guess uh, to validate it yeah and what about the lack of sound oh yeah well uh the work if you properly would be in a gallery and you would have the sound of the film falling and moving um so that's something i have an experience with the work and maybe it completely activates the work further or might ruin the potential of the work um but really the sound would be the operation of the of the projector mhm so then the film becomes just as much about the medium uh and not just about you know uh the kind of journey that the subject matter in the film is about that's mm. only half of it and then the medium of film and the image is a layer in itself mm. right and maybe maybe if i had like a rec- uh, audio recorder and i'd recorded it maybe the sound of the environment would distract from your focus on the image of the environment so maybe it helps uh crystallize what you're looking at i think so because you probably draw you in too much into into the subject's temporality and mm. you would lose yourself in the in the traveling aspect of the film and then you mm. it's like when when you watch a movie you totally forget your body exists and you only live for the movie for 2 hours. Ah, uh, Robert Smithson speaks about the film as a space or like as the space of film as a sculpture when you're in a cinema. Um as a being like time out of your yourself. Um so that's a really interesting um like thing to play on, isn't it? Mm. Oh, I've just seen C4 have said I haven't seen that film. Oh, no. Have you looked at Alfred Yard Lynch and May's book The View from the Road I haven't I will look at it or send you a link to it please Awesome do you think we should wrap up or I think so yeah because we don't want to make this too long No so if there are no other questions thank you everybody for joining us this evening and this video would be available to watch on our IGTV And thank you Alex so much. Oh look, a question quickly. <laughs> That's when everyone else rolls their eyes like, "Oh god, why will it end?" <laughs> um, <laughs> given the fact you both are interested in similar themes, have you considered a collaboration? Well, just this conversation has been a collaboration and uh Laura writing the piece has been a collaboration. Uh her viewing the work has been a collaboration. But yeah, I guess maybe we should actually make something. 
Yeah, sounds good. <laughs> Add to the to-do list. Yeah. Um, for when lockdown ends and we can meet in person. Yes, definitely. <laughs> okay, thanks everybody and thanks so much, Alex, for um, allowing me to just express all the crazy ideas I had about the film. I think it was really nice to have this freedom. Uh, well, and thank you for joining me tonight. Well, thank you for your time and thank you for putting the energy in as well. Awesome. See Bye, you soon. everybody. Bye.